Good evening, and uh, thanks for joining us. I'm John Wilkerson, current chair of the Political Science Department, and tonight's moderator. This is the second of three political science faculty panels on the 220, 2020 elections. Two weeks ago, Susan Whiting and Asim Prakash talked about the election's likely impacts on our relationship with China and climate change policy. Today, we are fortunate to have two distinguished faculty members focusing on the election itself. Two weeks from now, on Thursday, October 29th, Becca Thorpe and Scott Lemieux will be considering the domestic policy implications of the election and discussing the Supreme Court vacancy and the role that the courts are playing and may play in the election. I would also like to mention that our own Megan Ming Francis is giving a UW public lecture protests for the soul of a nation, COVID-19, Black Lives Matter, and election 2020 on Monday, October 26th. More information about these and other events can be found on the department's website. Today, Mark Allen Smith will first speak on polls, campaign messages, and the Electoral College. James Long will then speak on domestic and foreign manipulation of voting in the 2020 elections. After both have spoken, about 15 minutes each, we will have questions, and you should see a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Please use it to submit a question at any time. Finally, if you have connectivity issues, we'll be recording this event and making it available on the department's website in a few days. So let's get started. Mark Allen Smith is Professor of Political Science and Associate Chair of the department. He specializes in American politics, but his research interests are quite eclectic, ranging from elections and interest groups to political culture, to religion, morality, and politics. Mark also teaches a popular and fascinating undergraduate course titled Seeking Truth in an Age of Misinformation, Cynicism, and Political Polarization. So welcome, Mark. Mark, excuse me, your microphone. All right. So uh, thank you for that, for that introduction. In um, talking about this election, there's a lot of things that, that could be said. Um, that's partly why we have six um, different uh, um, presentations, but frankly, we could have a lot more than that, and, and it, could, it could go on indefinitely. So in my presentation, I'd like to carve out in my 15-minute chunk something that um, it is both coherent, but hopefully gives you a, a little bit of uh, information or insight that you, you might not easily have accessible elsewhere. Although I will draw from sources that I think many of you will in fact be familiar with. Um, so it's going to be about um, the Electoral College, how that plays out in 2020. Also looking back to how that compares into to, to 2016 and how the, how the polls um, operated in 1996 and how they're operating in, in 2020. So the first concept I want to introduce is the tipping point. So because we have an electoral college system, it's a state by state uh, vote to the national popular vote doesn't determine the uh, presidential winner, it's the electoral college that determines the, elect, the, the, the winner. And you need a majority of the votes in the Electoral College in order to become president. And the tipping point we could define as the state that pushes a candidate over an Electoral College majority. So imagine that for um, each, each uh, candidate or party, um, they have an array of states and they're performing differently across these states. So they have some states that are rock solid, you know, for Republicans, it's Wyoming, it's, it's West Virginia for Democrats, it's say California, Hawaii. And then there's some states in the middle that are more competitive that could, could go for, for either party. So to calculate the tipping point, you just take all the states that, that the winning candidate won, so that they candidate with the Electoral College majority, start shaving off from the bottom an equal number of um, points, percentages of the vote from each state. And eventually you'll get to a point where they lose a state that they, that they otherwise had, had won. Um, and in this hypothetical, you just keep going till you get to a point where it's the last state that they needed in order to get their electoral college majority. So they keep that state, they keep all the states where they had a bigger margin than that, 
And that one state, the last one they needed is, is the tipping point. And when we run those calculations for the last six elections, here are the tipping point states. Um, interesting that Pennsylvania shows up three times, including the last two elections. And you will all remember in 2000, the Florida um, butterfly ballot, hanging chads, recounts, Supreme Court cuts that off, um, effectively making George W. Bush president, and so on. So Florida was tipping point state in 2000, but in our last two ones, it has been uh, Pennsylvania. Um, so that's the, the tipping point state. Now, another concept that we could uh, be curious about is, um, suppose we had a hypothetical 50-50 split between the two major parties, so leaving third parties out of the calculation, in the national popular vote. Which party would win the presidency in that situation? Well, I'm going to say whichever candidate would and party would win in a, in a hypothetical 50-50 split, they have the advantage in the Electoral College. And then furthermore, we'd be curious, well, how big is that advantage? Is it a small advantage? Is, is it a big advantage? So a um, way to quantify this, by how much could the advantage party lose the national popular vote and yet still win the electoral college because it wins the tipping point state, the, the, which we've already talked about, and by winning the tipping point state plus all the other states that are more favorable toward that party than the tipping point state, they therefore win a, a majority in the electoral college. Well, when we run these calculations for the last six elections, here's what we get. Um, interestingly, we look down that column and you'll see that Democrats were actually favored in the Electoral College in four of those six elections. Uh, I think most people would assume that Republicans are continually favored. The reason they would assume that is because we've had two elections out of the last six where the national popular vote winner did not become president. Instead, the national popular vote minority candidate gets a majority in the Electoral College, therefore becomes president. That was in 2000 with the Florida situation and again in our very last election. So one way to think about this is there's nothing inherent in the Electoral College that would make it favor one party or over the other. And in recent history, it's more often favored Democrats. The problem for Democrats is that the very elections when they were favored, in effect, it didn't matter because they won the popular vote by so much that the, the popular vote winner and the Electoral College winner matched. And so big deal, they were gonna, they were gonna win no matter what. But the two elections when Republicans had the advantage in the Electoral College, that's when it really mattered. So they were able to lose the national popular vote, but win a majority in the Electoral College and thus capture uh, the presidency. And in the next um, table, uh, the next column of the table, I'm going to show you the size of the Electoral College advantage. And you can see that you know, these are generally small advantages, but a little larger in 2016, where it was up to 2.8% advantage for the uh, um, Republicans. Meaning, in 2016, Donald Trump could have lost the national popular vote by 2.8% and still hung on to Pennsylvania by one vote, and therefore still won a national, uh, sorry, an electoral college majority and thus become uh, president. Well, the next thing I want to think about is how does this play out in 2020? Which party is advantaged and by how much in the Electoral College in the election we're witnessing right now? Well, the election hasn't been held, so we, we really don't know. Um, we don't have voting results yet. We do have polls, which we could use. And then you might say, like, well, polls, but aren't these the very same polls that were really inaccurate in 2016? So if they were inaccurate in 2016, why would we trust them in 2020? So I want to spend a little bit of time looking at the accuracy of the 2016 polls. And I'm going to draw here from a source that uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, which is uh, Nate Silver, who uh, is a kind of a statistician, public intellectual, who runs a site called 538. And um, he compiles uh, polls, so they're not original to him. He's just grabbing data from, from all the people, all the organizations that are putting out polls. And he has a variety of techniques that he uses to assess their accuracy, you know, their past accuracy. Does a poll have a particular lean? What's the sample size? What's the methodology? So he tries to adjust for a variety of factors um, to end up on election eve with a forecast of what's likely to happen um, on the election. And when he did this in 2016, uh, his very final forecast, his predicted vote shares was Clinton winning a uh, national popular vote um, 
I guess in this case, plurality by 3.6%. So, eh, the, you know, a, not, not a tiny win, but not a landslide either. So a, a, a noticeable win. And he also, based upon the, his model, gave Clinton odds of winning the presidency of 71% and Trump of 29%. Uh, and that's because this 3.6 national vote margin um, that he was forecasting, well, there's some error associated with that. And then there's also some potential error associated with all the individual states that go in to compile this national margin. And he built into the model things like the possibility for correlated error across states. And um, so on the election eve, he was giving uh, Trump a 29% chance of, of being elected. Now, afterward, a lot of people went after um, Silver saying like, you know, ah, oh, you know, the, your, your, your forecast was really bad because you, you said, you said, you told me Clinton was going to win. She didn't win. Trump, Trump won. Well, he didn't say Clinton was going to win. He said, based upon the data he had and the model he was using, Clinton was more likely to win. But Trump still had a very sizable chance of winning. And, um, you know, like if you've ever rolled a die before and gotten a one or a two, you can't be surprised when an outcome that's not the most likely outcome, but it's still fairly likely, actually happens. And that's what played out in, in 2016. So he had forecast um, Clinton winning by 3.6%. And now we're going to get into the, the amount of polling error. So there was some polling error. And uh, instead, she ends up winning by 2.1%. So notice that, yeah, the polls were off. But they weren't off actually by that much. At least the national polls weren't off by that much. But if you look at some state polls, especially in some of the close and, and, and competitive states, um, they were off by more than that in those states. So based upon the data that, that, that Silver had, he was predicting uh, Democratic wins in Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and, and Michigan. Instead, you end up with uh, uh, Trump wins in those. And so notice that even though the national polls are only off by about one and a half percent, in these crucial states, that, including the tipping point state, they're off by about four and a half percent. And that's why um, Trump is able to become uh, the president by winning, by winning those states. Well, another way to slice this is to look at, at um, Trump's um, constituency in, in 2016. And this is comparing counties where Trump increased the Republican vote um, relative to what Romney had gotten four years earlier. And you can see the scale down here. So the, uh, and this is at the county level. So thus you see the you know, little squares and so on. So the deep red is, is Trump improved on Romney by more than nine. The pink, he improved by less than three. Trump actually did worse than, than Romney. Well, notice that throughout the spell, you know, the mid Notice that if you head there, but there's also some gray. The gray happens to be in the more urban areas, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, uh, the middle of the state, Harrisburg, including uh, State College, a university town. But you wrap all that up together and, and uh, Trump is improving on, on uh, Romney's uh, performance. So you can see Trump, um, um, kind of the upshot of this graph is, is, is that the, is, it's Trump did a lot better than Romney in the Rust Belt, particularly. And the, and the, and I'm going to show you next that the polls didn't, didn't expect that. So this is uh, indicating relative to the national popular vote. So um, in, in Silver's 2016 forecast, he had the Democrats winning, uh, being 1.1% more uh, favorable in Wisconsin than they, they were nationally. In other words, that Wisconsin was going to be a tiny bit more Democratic than the country. Pennsylvania also a tiny bit more democratic than the country and Michigan slightly more. And what actually happened was that all three of those states were less democratic than the country. They were more Republican than the rest of the country by 2.8% in, in uh, Wisconsin and 2.9% in, in the tipping point uh, state of Pennsylvania. Well, how about in 2000? What's, what's being forecast, what's silver forecasting in 2000? Well, as of his data for today, um, the state polls that we have are showing Wisconsin slightly more Republican than the country, Pennsylvania slightly even more Republican than the country, Michigan only a tiny bit more Republican than the country. And because Pennsylvania in, um, in, in Silver's current model, it's uh, still the tipping point state. And thus, um, because Pennsylvania is 1.8% more Republican than the country, you could peel that away. And if as long, so long as Trump wins Pennsylvania by one vote, assuming that 
the other states uh, line up accordingly. Uh, he would therefore win the tipping point state, therefore win the presidency and thus the Republican Electoral College advantage in 2000, based upon these forecasts, is 1.8%. Uh, um, now, one, um, one reason why, so, so notice that in, in 2016, the polls basically weren't expecting the surge in Trump support in the, in, the, in the Midwest. But by 2020, they kind of know that happens. They've adjusted their techniques, especially like their weighting. Um, so Trump's uh, gains in, in, um, in, in these states, the, the polls weren't expecting that in 2016. But now that 2016 base is part of how the, how the polls are being conducted in 2020. So whereas Trump's support in the Midwest, it snuck up on the pollsters in, in 2016, it's not sneaking up on anybody in 2020 because the pollsters have adjusted their techniques, um, like uh, adjusting like their turnout models, uh, waiting for rural versus urban, various education levels and, and so on to try to um, you know, be more accurate this, this time. And by the way, they, they, they were considerably more accurate in 2018 um, not a presidential year, but in the in the congressional uh, elections and midterm elections that were held that year. Well, what's uh, Silver's model showing in in 2020? Well, as of this morning, when I when I grabbed the data from him, um, his model is predicting a Biden win with an 87 percent and a Trump at 13 percent. But you know, 13 percent, it's like, well, that, that's the kind of thing that happens. Like if you you know if you play Russian roulette. Um, and your odds of, uh, you know, being on the wrong end of that was 13%, that's probably not a bet you would take. So 13% uh, is still a significant chance of a Trump win, according to his model. And if you look at the, the point estimates of his forecast, he's got um, uh, Joe Biden winning nationally by 8.3%. By the way, that's a little uh, less by a, a few percentage points than what a, a lot of the national polls you might have seen. And that's because Silver's model builds in what he calls, quote, mean reversion. So when the campaign has been pretty stable, as this one has been, where the, the, the Biden lead's been like, you know, seven to 10 points, uh, or more like six and a half to even, even eight, uh, from like, you know, uh, May to, uh, to October, when, when Biden then goes up, his model kind of builds in the, the possibility of that fading back, because that tends to be what's happened in previous elections. So anyway, he's, uh, Silver's got uh, Biden winning by 8.3% 8, 8 nationally, winning Wisconsin by 7% winning the tipping point state of Pennsylvania by 6.5%. Um, and then Trump in turn, uh, or I'm sorry, once Biden wins Pennsylvania, he's won the tipping point state. Um, uh, and uh, he thus wins, 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 uh, wins the presidency. And that will wrap um, me up. So my, my presentation is actually gonna feed very well into uh, uh, Professor Long's because I haven't taken into account a bunch of things. I'm kind of assuming all the votes will be counted. I'm assuming that, the, that uh, people aren't systematically excluded from voting. I mean, I'm assuming here in these calculations, no foreign or domestic manipulation of voting, the very things that, that uh, Sean Long is now going to talk about. So I gladly turn over the floor uh, to him. Thank you, Mark. Uh, fascinating. James Long is Associate Professor of Political Science, specializing in comparative politics with particular interests in Sub-Saharan Africa and Central and South Asia. He teaches about democracy, elections, and corruption, and is involved in international efforts to combat election fraud and corruption. James is also the co-founder of the Political Economy Forum and the host of an exciting new podcast series that I'd like to recommend called uh, Neither Free Nor Fair, it's about election security and the fate of democracy in the 21st century. A number of episodes have already been posted on topics including democratic backsliding, mail-in voting, the presidential debate, social media and misinformation, and how the US compares globally to other democracies um, and vice versa. You can find out more on the political science website. So welcome, James. Great, thanks a lot, John. So in answer to the question, will your vote matter? I think part of the answer depends a great deal on domestic and foreign manipulation of the vote in 2020. 
Let me explain why. Now, first of all, as Mark suggested, you know, we could get a result on election day or shortly thereafter that is a very clear Biden win um, overall, as well as mapped onto the Electoral College. So that is still a possibility. And we could also get a, sort of a definitive Trump win as well in the Electoral College. Um, you know, if, if, if you believe the polling, you probably think Biden has a, a stronger chance right now. But perhaps the president has time to turn that around or appeal to new voters or uh, otherwise get out the vote in, in ways that the, the Democrats are not. Um, and so we could get an outcome that is one, one or two of these, can one of these two candidates wins definitively and the other side concedes and that's kind of a, a normal election result that we have in the United States. That's possible, but I'm not sure how likely it is. And to get you to understand why, I want you to shift your frame in terms of how you think about elections in the United States. And in two ways, let me talk about the first way. First, I want you to shift your frame in terms of thinking about the United States as being a democracy that the founders in the Constitution thought of every possible uh, way in which an election could be contested. And the Constitution itself provides us a lot of guidance about how to deal with the contested election and or the Constitution and, and the rule of law in the United States are such that elect electoral fraud or manipulation are unlikely. That's not true. Historically, there's been lots of electoral manipulation in the United States, as well as uh, contested election results. And the Constitution actually doesn't do a great job. The Constitution says very, very little. And so additional amendments, as well as statutes, have tried to, um, to, to fix that. But a lot of this is, are things that we haven't seen very recently. And a lot of these things are things that haven't necessarily been tested through the courts or uh, legislated on or interpreted. The other aspect of kind of the normal election frame that I want you to, to probably put aside is if you have lived through a contested election, if you're old enough to have voted or remember uh, Bush v. Gore in Florida, I also think that this, the, the problems and the challenges in this election are not likely to be that localized to one state and come down to the vote count in one state. Rather, I think there's going to be adjudication and disputes potentially across multiple states. And of course, what ended this election here was the fact that Gore conceded. And we have saber rattling on both sides in both campaigns right now that neither side is necessarily um, going to concede as easily as Gore conceded after Bush v. Gore. They may continue to try to fight and find other avenues. So the first frame I want you to sort of push aside is that the United States system in its history is strong enough to prevent foreign and domestic manipulation of an election. That hasn't been true and it's not necessarily going to be true in the uh, election we're about to uh, witness. However, we do know that the president has discarded many democratic, well, first of all, laws, as well as norms and other sorts of uh, things that many leaders have abided to recently. And so I understand that there is a lot of worry on the part of, of whether or not the president will abide by certain norms and laws. He has not said that he will concede if he thinks that he didn't actually lose. Um, he has said that he's not necessarily willing to have a, a peaceful transfer of power um, or give up office. So I understand that there's that worry there. I also think it's also the case that people on the left, on, among the Democrats and Biden supporters, um, are not necessarily going to give up as easily as they did in 2000 either. I think the protests coming out of the murder of George Floyd and the mobilization for racial justice over the last few months that we uh, that we witnessed may feed into protest against any sort of perception of electoral malpractice. The second frame, which is on the flip side that I kind of want you to put aside for a little bit is that that even if you think Trump has authoritarian, authoritarian tendencies, and he does, that the United States is such a weak system that a coup would be possible in the United States. I don't think that that's correct either. And I think that that frame should be put aside as well. Um, yes, Donald Trump may say a lot of things that disturb a lot of people. And yes, he may, he may appear as though he has authoritarian tendencies. But the United States' system and the system on which we conduct elections is actually fairly strong and has gotten stronger since 2000 in many, many ways. And so even if he desires it himself, I don't want you to think that necessarily Trump has the power to, for instance, delay the election date, which he doesn't, to um, cancel elections, which he can't do, to somehow put off an inauguration on January 20th, which he cannot and will not do. Typically in other countries, 
we think of coups, a coup is just an illegal seizure of government. It doesn't necessarily require the military, but often it does involve the military. Donald Trump will not be able to harness the resources of the US military to have a coup um, and take power. That will not happen in the United States. So instead, I want you to adopt a frame that is somewhere in between that applies to democracies in the all, all throughout the world, but it hasn't necessarily been the way that most Americans think about their own democracy or their own elections, which is that lots of countries that are democracies have elections that are competitive, but they're not always fair. Sometimes there's hints of authoritarianism that, that seeps into those elections. And oftentimes uh, political actors can use law actually to their advantage as well as actually break the law or have clearly illicit behaviors that help them uh, to win at the margins. Now, in those settings where democracy is not so strong to prevent any kind of manipulation, but it's not so weak that there would be uh, the end of democracy, it doesn't mean that democracy is gonna die, but it also doesn't mean that democracy in elections aren't actually hard and don't require a lot of work to get right. And this is what most Americans don't realize, is this has always been true in the United States. It's just very unfamiliar and not well known among a lot of the electorate. And now that we're learning it, the simple fact that it's unfamiliar doesn't mean that it's necessarily broken. So how did we get here? That is, what is the frame with which I want you to think about what the outcome of this election might be and how foreign and domestic manipulation may play a role? Anytime you have a person in power who really likes being in power, they need an off ramp if you want them to leave office. Now, in a democracy, that off ramp is that they just lost the election and most candidates or parties will agree to fight, uh, you know, fight another day and, and, and try to contest again. In authoritarian countries, leaders in power don't wanna leave the off ramp because they like being in office a lot. I think in this election, you have to ask your question, what is the off ramp for Donald Trump and why does he appear unwilling to take any kind of off ramp, even if he loses, um, even if he clearly loses in the election? Why is he behaving in this way? Because strong democracies have clear off ramps, but weak democracies, the off ramps become a little bit more tenuous. I think Donald Trump has two reasons why he doesn't want to leave office. The first is that he himself and potentially members of his family could be indicted with numerous uh, crimes once he does leave office, whenever that is. And I think he's worried about doing that. And what we learned from the outcome of the Mueller investigation is that he won't be indicted while he's in office. And what we've seen recently in, in, in various news outlets is that he probably has reasons to believe that he could be indicted were he to leave office. Now, more recently, what we've seen is that uh, with the publication of Donald Trump's uh, the tax records by the New York Times is I think he has a second reason not to want to leave office, which is of course that he has no money and his brand isn't really worth anything anymore. He's potentially around half a billion dollars in debt, uh, 400 million of that we're not sure to whom, 100 million potential penalty to the IRS. And so Donald Trump doesn't have an off ramp because he doesn't want to face prosecution or be indicted potentially, and because he has severe financial problems once he does leave office. And in fact, this is a lot like an authoritarian country where people stay in office because they know they've committed a number of human rights violations or other types of crimes that they'll be pr prosecuted for if they leave, as well as one of the reasons that people like to stay in office is making themselves or their family uh, wealthy. Now, I don't think Donald Trump has gotten wealthy from being in office, but I do think he, we, he is worried and reasonably so about the implications of no longer being president. So I think you have to ask yourself the question, and I'm not really going to answer it, I'm, I'm just going to pose it, what is Donald Trump's off ramp? How could he leave office in, 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 in such a way that he doesn't fear indictment? And how could he leave office in such a way that he's not worried about the financial implications of, of losing the presidency? So what then can we say about foreign and domestic manipulation? Well, the first thing I wanna focus on is the process. And a lot of people have talked about the influence, particularly of foreign actors of, of misinformation on social media, and that that is a real problem in this uh, upcoming election because they saw what happened in 2016 with Russian interference on social media there. I actually think this is a ruse. 
I think this doesn't really matter that much. I don't think uh, influence on social media is going to at all determine the outcome of this election for a couple reasons. One is we don't know necessarily or have great evidence that simply liking something or retweeting something is, is, is changing people's voting behavior in such a way to swing an election. But also I think because of what happened in 2016, that's all baked in. All the people that already belong to face group, uh, Facebook groups that you know do or don't believe X, Y, and Z, that's already baked in. That's already been included. There's no sort of swing constituency of people who are suddenly seeing fake news items on Facebook and deciding that they're going to change their mind about how to vote. So that is, I think, a place. I'm not saying that uh, misinformation is a good thing, but I don't think that's the place to necessarily look about what is going to determine the outcome of this election. Another thing that people have raised is how difficult it is to vote in the United States. And trust me, it's always been difficult to vote in the United States. And even as certain states and jurisdictions create new innovations to make it easier to vote, that doesn't solve every problem. And we have new problems. Well, one of the problem, new problems that we have in this election is, of course, COVID. We're trying to vote in the midst of a pandemic. And so uh, Georgia, you, p yesterday, people were very, very worried about the fact that on the first day of voting in Georgia, people had to wait in long lines. Well, part of the reason they had to wait in long lines is because of social distancing and fewer machines, uh, uh, voting locations once you get inside, a, inside of the, the polling center. But having to wait on a long line is not voter suppression. Having to wait on a lo long line is not what's going to undermine an election. And the good news is, is even though Georgia has a number of problems with its, its uh, voter accessibility, residents of Georgia have three weeks to vote. They still can adjust to these new realities and, and, and try to overcome them. So I also don't think the fact that it is difficult to vote is necessarily going to be what undermines this election. And moreover, I think it actually may mobilize more people to turn out in various ways. I also don't think that the threat of intimidation and violence before the election is likely to be what sort of swings it or matters. First of all, voter intimidation is illegal in this country. And I think law enforcement will have means at their disposal that if there are people harassing voters or, or polling station workers, then they will be able to action that. And so I don't think the, the threats and intimidation before the election are likely to be that consequential, uh, consequential to the outcome either. Instead, my fears all come with how the count will occur. First of all, you can manipulate the count by computer hacking into state and local administrative systems. We don't have a single national election. We have 50 state elections that occur across more than 8,000 jurisdictions. And what we know is in 2016, foreign elements were able to infiltrate 50 state systems the, the, the current literature suggests that national security officials in the Obama administration did not have evidence that Russia had changed vote totals, but absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, and they're not exactly quite sure, at least those that have gone on the record. So that could be a concern, again, at least for certain states that have not made upgrades to their uh, results transmission systems and reporting systems. Moreover, a new fear that has arisen has been, instead of hacking into election systems themselves, whether or not a foreign power like Russia would actually hack into the electricity grid to shut down the electricity in certain jurisdictions or states on election day. So that could be something that disrupts the voting as well. But I also think that there's going to be manipul manipulation of the count that has nothing to do with foreign actors and has everything to do with Americans in the US legal system and voting system which is the quote unquote legal hacking that may occur in manipulating the count in the United States. So I think because of COVID and because of the massive increase in mail-in voting, certain states have been doing this for a long time and they do it very well. States like Washington, Oregon, and California, but other states are really trying to now do mail-in voting at scale for the first time and they haven't had a lot of time to prepare themselves for that. And so I think the count could be very, very dicey in certain states. And I think in, in certain ways, uh, like in Florida, that's a picture there, uh, Florida 2000, some of these, you know, it may be hard to match signatures. It may actually be hard to, to determine vote outcomes. At the same time that I also think that the, the certain political interests, particularly on the Republican side, will try to challenge a lot of these ballots, particularly those that have been mailed in. We just have never had an election with this much mail-in voting. 
I also think the fear of violence in this election, from my perspective, is not in the pre-election period from, from intimidation, but rather that elements on both the left and the right may turn out during the disputed uh, potential uh, manipulation of the count to sort of saber rattle or to move the needle to protest to get, uh, to get uh, the, the count to work in their favor. My prediction would be that on, on the side of the Democrats that this will be mass protest and mass action for a fair count. My prediction in terms of the Republican side is that it will be strategically um, initiated and placed militias or, or other right-wing elements that try to disrupt the account, uh, account by election administrators or legislatures that are trying to adjudicate various things. So I really think it's the manipulation of the count and the sort of legal and, and quasi-legal ways that may try to influence how the ballots are actually counted. So then where does that leave us? Well, again, the outcome could be that either side wins pretty definitively, but the outcome could also be this very long drawn out legal process. And this is a very famous, this story in the Atlantic has gotten a lot of play, the election that could break America. I don't think it's the, that the election itself is going to break democracy in America, but rather that the adjudication and the manip potential manipulation of all these, these counts is going to reveal parts of the legal and administrative election process in the United States that haven't been stress tested always or haven't been stress tested in a long time. And so will be very unfamiliar to a lot of voters. That means that November 3rd, we may not know a lot. We may have to wait a long time for mail-in ballots to be counted. And in fact, December could be critical because the electoral college does not have, or the states don't have to uh, adjudicate all of their disputes until December 8th, and the electors will not be uh, sit until December 14th. Those will be critical dates, I think, if this, if this is disputed or goes on for a long time. But January may also come into play if the Electoral College, if there are different slates of electors issued by certain states, and this has to go to Congress, which would start on January 6th with the new president um, uh, uh, sworn in on January 20th. The thing that I want to warn everyone about is that I think regardless of what happens on November 3rd and 4th, and regardless of whether or not Donald Trump wins definitively or, or cries foul or all the rest of it, the greatest reality show in the history of the world will be between November 3rd and January 20th, that even if Donald Trump loses, he's such of television is such his medium and keeping people uncertain is, is why he's so popular and frustrating in equal measure that I think that he will keep people guessing and he will keep people guessing on purpose. And so I can imagine a scenario where we even get a very, very clear result by the morning of November 4th, but Donald Trump will not be able to help kind of keeping people guessing about whether or not he's going to have a peaceful transfer of power. And so what I would encourage people to do is in that period between November 3rd and January 20th, don't lose focus. Don't get distracted by the bright shiny object. Donald Trump will have the instinct and, and the ability to, to make this as confusing and uncertain as possible, but that doesn't mean that the fundamentals of the election aren't solid, and that doesn't mean we won't actually get a fair result. Because in answer to your question, will your vote matter? Well, your vote will matter if you vote. And so the, be the best advice I can give, regardless of how you think this is gonna turn out, is that everybody should turn out and vote. Thank you. Uh, thank you, James. That was um, fascinating and troubling. Um, okay, so we have a few minutes for questions. On the bottom of the screen, you'll see there's a, a Q&A button. And um, please, if you have a question, feel free to submit it. Give people a couple minutes here or a couple of seconds. Here's one for you, Mark. Um, does it matter to vote in non-competitive states? Yes, absolutely. For one thing, president is not the only race on the ballot. There's uh, in our state, you know, governor or their state legislature or their, um, uh, in our state, we generally don't do uh, lo local elections. Um, those, are the, those are the odd years, but there are other statewide elections. Um, there are initiatives and referenda so there's, there's a lot 
out there um, beyond, uh, beyond president. And also, it's a little bit of a weird way to think about voting that the, the, the only reason to vote is because your vote like could be the decisive vote. Like historically, that is the way that like certain uh, uh, theories in political science have thought about it. But voting is also expressive. It's about you indicating, you know, what you want to happen, you identifying with um, social groups, with, 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 with a political party. Um, and so for any one person, frankly, even if you're in Pennsylvania, the odds of one vote deciding it is, is so infinitesimal. Um, so I just think it's the wrong way to, to think about it is like, you know, could my vote like be decisive? And because I'm in Washington, a non-competitive state, therefore who cares? I just don't think that's a very useful way to think about voting. Instead, it's, it's a matter of expressing your, your belief, aligning with other people with similar beliefs um, and participating in the system rather than like you being the one decisive vote. Great, thank you. Um, James, so you mentioned um, a number of uh, potentially troubling outcomes. Uh, other than voting, what can people do? Um, I, the, first of all, being informed is really, really critical because again, wh what is happening is, is um, a, a, like I said, a lot of this is unfamiliar, at least at scale. You know, people may know, you know, people in Michigan may know that there was a problem in Michigan, or we know that there was a problem in, in, in Florida in 2000. But what this is revealing is all the weaknesses of the U.S. electoral system kind of coming to the fore at the time that we have a we have a president who says he's not going to leave, um, a, a, as well as the as the pandemic. So I think just being informed is really really critical. And and I I have to give a credit to Americans. These are issues that we're not used to worrying about. I mean, do we know do we know a lot about forensic signature matches? And do we know you know how election administrators have been figuring that out? You know, people have been doing these jobs for a long time, and a lot of states do this very well, but it's easy to forget that. And it's easy to not kind of know what the new challenges are. So I think being informed is number one. Number two is keeping your eye on the ball. The latest tweet, the latest story, long lines, none of that matters. What matters is that we allow election administration to run the election, that we allow the process to unfold, Elections are for voters, we vote, and then we sit back and we let people do their jobs. And if there are worries, if there are um, reasons to peacefully protest, then, you know, that could be an option. But I think staying out of it as much as possible and letting, the, and letting people do their jobs as much as possible is really, really, really critical in this election. Great, thank you. Uh, Mark, um, so that electoral college, uh, do the members of the electoral college have to do what constituents want? Is that something that we should be worried about in this election? Um, so uh, over the last, say, 50 years, um, there's been a, a large pool of electors who, in fact, violated who they were pledged for. Um, so uh, it, to, um, um, go go against who, who they've pledged for. There was a, a case before the Supreme Court this, this very year. Um, so a bunch of states, including Washington, have imposed penalties, so um, significant fines, where if you're an elector in the Electoral College and you were basically picked by the party because you were pledging in advance to support the party's candidate, and then you didn't to do that, then the state would, would levy a heavy fine on you um, then the Supreme Court had to consider, are those um, penalties constitutional? And they said yes. So um, there have been a large handful of electors who violated their, their pledges. Um, states have then countered by imposing these fines and, and uh, um, the, the Supreme Court is, is I think as a practical matter, if you kind of look at the individual cases where the electors did violate their, their pledge, it was all because they knew what all the other electors were doing. So in effect, they knew like, well, I'll just, you know, what the heck, oh. Um, so like in 1988, um, some of the, so this was like two or three of the Democratic electors, they didn't like the, the, the presidential nominee, they liked the vice presidential nominee better, so they voted for the, for the vice president. It's been things like that, where they, they just, they wouldn't do that. Um, if it, if like that, that vote was, was gonna be one of the last ones that was necessary. So this is like a theoretical concern. 
but I think as a practical matter, um, we got bigger things to worry about. Thank you. Uh, Professor Long, so you, you encouraged me to, to pitch all the questions. Don't try to edit them. So here's one for you. Uh, for Professor Long, what's the doomsday scenario that you think is most likely to occur in this election? So the, the worst thing, the likelihood of the thing that's worse? Yeah. I, I, I wouldn't put a number on the probability, but the worst thing would be uh, infiltration into, uh, into a way that disrupts the process while it's happening. So hitting the power grid on election day or manipulating results um, in, in the system, not, not necessarily throwing out ballots, but somebody hacking into the system. That, that's the doomsday scenario. Because, and, there, and there's a particular reason for that. That's happened in every country I think I've worked in, some version of that. Not the electricity grid, but the hacking has. In fact, it happened in, the first election I'm aware of is 1994 in South Africa. There was, it was, it was low rent hacking at that time, but it was still electronic. The problem in the United States is you can't rerun an election for the most part at, at, at the presidential level. Meaning if, 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 well, not Washington, but if uh, Michigan loses power on election day and nobody can vote, how do you rerun that election? The United States does not have provisions on this the way other countries do, and for good reason, right? I mean, when it came down to Bush v. Gore, there was talk about, well, why doesn't Florida just re-vote? Well, so what, all other 49 states who could do their job and voters, like we're now supposed to allow the people of Florida to redo it? I mean, you could get a totally different outcome. So there's good reason for that. But there, the problem is, is that there's no way to really protect against that. And if you were to see electronic hacking into systems, it depends on the state and the jurisdiction. There can be a paper trail that allows you to recreate a legitimate vote, but not always. And it could be very, very hard to detect. Do you mind if I follow up here with with? Uh, with but I'm not going to put a probability on that. Okay, it's 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 not zero, but it's not 100. percent I mean, you can go you can sleep well, but not that well. I would say. <laughs> go ahead, Mark. Um, so there are things that could keep me up at night, and this one is one of them. So just um, yesterday, or maybe it was the day before, it was the last day of registration in in Virginia, and they did have this precise power outage that you're talking about. And the official line from the, 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 the governor yeah. was like, well, some utility workers like accidentally cut, cut the wrong line. So they, they attributed it to, you know, ordinary error of utility workers. Um, but I mean, I, I guess we, uh, you know, we don't have any reason to, uh, necessarily to, to, to doubt that. But if it's possible for utility workers to cut the wrong line and, um, for this to happen, they're probably not the only ones who are aware of the means of shutting down the electricity grid. And now you've kind of got me scared that, you know, um, this wouldn't be all that hard to do. And no, you know, are the backup generators, are there, is there any solution to this problem? Protecting our electricity grid, yeah. But yeah, exactly. Are there, are there backup solutions to protecting our, our electricity grid? Well, that would take us down a rabbit hole, I, f I feel, but there, there, isn't, there isn't great backup systems on the, elector on the electoral management side, which I think is a, is a larger problem. Unless there's a paper trail, there's a way to audit or recreate vote counts. Hmm. Um, so this could be either one of you, but do you have a sense of what states or cities um, the vote count battles are most likely to occur in? Um, and do you know anything about Right, how the how the the role of new judicial appointments might might play into that process, or uh, recent judicial appointments might play into that process. Yeah. So the easy answer is you're most likely to see these controversies emerge in the close and competitive states because there's various things you can do to kind of you know shave off margins and so on, but. You're not going to swing California for, for Trump. It's just it's just not in the cards. Um, whereas if if a state was already already close and um, well, like let's just take Pennsylvania, if you could figure out a way to cut the electricity to Pennsylvania and Pittsburgh, so somehow the major urban areas they can't vote, but you can vote in the rest of the state. Well, we know the urban areas are where most a disproportionate share of the Democratic voters are. So that would be a pretty clever way to. Uh, try to affect the, the results in, in Pennsylvania. And you're more likely to see these kind of things emerge in, um, in those close and competitive states. And we've, we, of course, have some precedent for that. In, in, in 2000, 
you know, long before we knew about the hanging chads and the butterfly bow and the recount and all that, the, the Florida Secretary of State did some really aggressive purging of the voter rolls that including that included um, like matching names where it, it isn't, wasn't even very good matching, like you're gone. Um, so you're, you're more likely to see that happen in a state like Florida than in uh, either like uh, a very heavily Republican state, you know, Alabama, Wyoming, or a heavily Democratic state like say Washington or Massachusetts. I have a slightly different answer on that, which is the competitive states that are doing massive mail-in ballots at scale for the first time. So Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Florida are going to have a hard time just trying to count their ballots because they haven't done mail-in ballots at this level, like Washington and Oregon. So I think there will be legitimate you know, potential slowdowns there, as well as potentially legitimate legal cases that arise there. Great. Um, James, uh, this question I know you have the answer to, and it's an important, important question. Um, do all states have paper ballots that back up their digital tally like nope. Washington does? Nope. The good states are good and they've gotten better since 2000. Colorado, Utah, Oregon, Washington, California, the bad states stay bad, southeast, a little bit in the, on the east coast, and the states in the middle have really been struggling. That's the, a lot of the Midwest. Um, so for both of you on election night, so we should be focused on what happens in Pennsylvania. Is that, is that the lesson of your, your lecture, Mark? That's the only Well, assuming, assuming you have um, the Pennsylvania results, but um, in, in a way you don't necessarily need Pennsylvania. What you need are say a handful of, uh, of states where we have results and we're really confident in those results and benchmark them against um, 2016. And so suppose it's a very heavily uh, Republican state, like let's go back to Alabama. If Trump in 2016 only wins it in 2020 by say 22 points, like, well, he just lost a lot of ground. And if he's losing ground in Alabama, he's probably losing ground in other states as well. So even if we don't have the Pennsylvania results yet, if we can benchmark the states we do have against the 2016 results, we have a pretty good good guess of what's going to happen in the other states because um, I had to cut this data out of my talk on the interest of time. But the like the relative uh, position of the states doesn't change much uh, over a four year period. So um, the states that are in the Republican coalition last time they're going to stay, and the states in the Democratic coalition and, and so on. So they're kind of rising and falling together. So if Trump falls even in the states that he still wins, then that means he's also going to be falling in the close and competitive states. So um, really any definitive results from any states is, is useful information that, that gives us some insights and in what's likely to happen, as James indicates, in once all the, like, the mail-in ballots are, are counted. Okay, here's a question for both of you. Um, October surprise, uh, which refers to uh, new information uh, uh, coming out in information, quote unquote, right, coming out uh, just prior to the election that can have an impact on the on the outcome of the election. So it looks like Biden is uh, well ahead at the moment, but um, you know what's the likelihood that uh, something like an you know, October surprise could occur in this election, as it seemed to have occurred in 2016? And if any thoughts about what that might be. Uh, yeah, so I, I originally I thought it would be a fake COVID thing, a, a fake vaccine. Um, I think that's going to be harder now. Then I thought it would be kind of Russian social media influence. But again, I think that's already baked in. My guess would be that the most, I mean, I, I hate trying to guess. The, the Russian government has been placing fake news in this whole Ukrainian thing for a long time. And so what I think is going to happen is, in Giuliani has been really susceptible to that. The KGB has been following Giuliani for years as he's been poking around Ukraine. Of course, it's all made up. But I think what they'll do is try to have some surprise where the Russians have planted something in Ukraine that Giuliani discovers. It's like Hunter Biden emails or something like that. It'll all be fake. It'll all be made up. And whether it moves the needle, I don't know. But that would be my guess. Mark, you gonna bite? <laughs> um, no, I, I like James's answer a lot. I, I was just gonna say we we did have the one allegation of a of a Joe Biden um, 
you know, sexual harassment slash sexual assault. And a lot of journalists looked into it. And then the, the woman's story, it, it kind of changed. And she'd been shopping the story for, for over a year. And um, at, in the process of her shopping, it, it changed a lot. And I, I think most people investigated it concluded that it just, it just didn't hold up very well. Um, are there other potential stories out there that would help hold up better? Uh, and frankly, even a made up story, if you do it really well, like it actually might be persuasive. Um, so we, we could get something like that. So I, I'd say be on the lookout for some kind of Joe Biden sexual assault uh, story. Now on Trump's side, there's already been like what, 20 of them. So the 21st one is probably not gonna move the needle if the first 20 of them um, didn't. But on Biden's side, it, it potentially could. Great. Let's see what else we have here. We've got probably time for a couple more questions. Let me go to the bottom of the list. Um, so I, I think this is this goes for Mark. This kind of goes back to your your discussion of polling, right? Um, so one of the things that's interesting is is that uh, it sounds like five thirty eight Nate Silver. Um, you know they think they've made the adjustments and they've got it right this time, right? But um, uh, you know what? What might go wrong in terms of the polling this year, um, and and what does that tell us about um, sort of the history of polling more generally, and the extent to which you know polling is sort of you know you're fighting the last battle every time you do polling mm -hmm. in the current election. Yeah, um, all, all good points. I mean, I would just start out by saying the current 13% chance for Trump. 13 is a lot more than zero. So a lot of people are talking like, oh, Biden's got a big lead, you know, it's in the bag. Like, well, according to, to Silver's model, uh, no. So a variety of things could go wrong. Um, one is the turnout projections. So um, I, I just kind of noticed this, this my, myself. I'll just say like my, my wife is a fan of, of, um, of, of true crime, like videos and, and uh, stories and so on. And it's like every time she watches one of these, there there's some Trump ad, and they're really aggressive at like collecting your 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 email and giving you every chance to like sign up. And uh, I think that the, the true crime uh, audience does does skew more uh, more Republican. So if if Trump's doing a bunch of stuff um, and his turnout operation is 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 better than than Biden's, and somehow it, it's it's not just better this year, but it's also better than his own turnout operation was in 2016. Because remember all the 2016 results are kind of feeding into the, 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 the waiting techniques and so on for this time. So it would have to be kind of something new that's a little different than what we had in 2016. But suppose that the Trump operation is better than the polls are expecting and the Biden turnout operation is worse. And you kind of put those together and maybe that adds up to a few percentage points. And a few percentage points in Pennsylvania and Wisconsin and, you know, some maybe some other close and competitive states, maybe that's enough. So I would look out for something of, of that sort, some kind of pulling air um, that's really distributed across states in that way. Um, great, thanks. Uh, this probably should be our, our last question, and I think it's actually... Um, it's in a sense a softball, but I think it is a really important question. Um, aren't long lines completely avoidable? Uh, why don't we have uh, mail-in voting nationally? No, they're not. It takes a long time to vote, particularly when a lot of people want to vote and, and there's COVID. And why we don't have mail-in ballot nationally is because we don't have national elections. Um, we'd have to have a we'd have to fundamentally redo how we do elections but um no i mean it takes i'm so, you know it takes democracy it takes work it's it's not meant to be easy and it's not easy on purpose but e e even when it's hard it's hard because it's actually hard i mean you you go you go observe an election in kenya they get out at four o'clock in the morning they stand in line for 12 hours and that's how long it takes to vote that's just how long it takes and you know, mail-in ballots would be great, but we don't have a national election and we don't have an, a national election administration that would allow that to happen. Mark, anything? Well, um, I mean, I have a slightly different take, um, especially on something that, that James said earlier, that I think it is possible to use voting suppression. And I think that there's good evidence that, that some states have, have done this. If you just shrink the number of polling places, 
in, in urban areas, you're going to increase the lines. And some states have done that, like Georgia did this in, in 2018. And then the, the hope, I think, among the, the party doing it is that some people will say like, well, I'm willing to wait for three hours, but I'm not willing to wait for six hours. And so some amount of the people peel away. Now, um, that strategy doesn't necessarily work because if there's also some evidence that if people think that you're trying to suppress their vote and that like, you're trying to block them from voting, that can really backfire. And they can say, screw you. Uh, I'm going to tell all my friends and like, they're trying to steal our vote from us. We've, we fought for this, especially, for example, in, in the Afri among African-Americans. Um, and if, if they have the perception that you're trying to take their vote away, that can actually stimulate higher turnout. So, um, you know, um, in theory, shrinking the number of voting places could discourage some number of, of people from standing in line, but it, it doesn't necessarily work. And so, um, you know, it's, it's a tricky matter. Great, thank you. Um, that's all the time we have. I'd like to thank the panelists, and I'd also like to thank Steve Dunn, our IT uh, administrator, for making this event possible. And thank you for joining us today. We had a great turnout today. Please join us in two weeks for the third and final panel featuring Becca Thorpe and Scott Lemieux. And uh, I encourage you to visit the department's website to learn more about other upcoming events. And there's also an option to sign up for our newsletter, which we will continue to keep informed. So thank you and good night.